Hi folks, how you all doing? Um, first of all, let me apologize for, um, missing out on last week's stream. Um, it was just one thing after another, unfortunately, that prevented me from being able to do the stream properly. Um, I thought I'd solved it, then I didn't, then something else happened, then something else, then something else, and in the end I just gave up because it was just I was just going around in circles, so I figured I'd put it off. Um I did try to get it ready for Friday, but again I hit more problems. I'm gonna talk about that briefly and then I'm gonna go straight into um what we're gonna be working on for um uh this, the current stream and also probably subsequent streams um i don't have much in the way of news um let me just do something here uh, Just change the workspace so you can see. My setup here. Let me know if you're uh, viewing. Say hello on the uh, chat if you're chatting or on Discord if you're on Discord. I can't republish anything on Discord, I'm afraid, because I don't have a um, plugin for that at the moment. Let me just let everyone know I'm live. Anyhow, I hope everyone's had a good week or so since my last um, stream. Uh, I've certainly been very busy, um, as I said earlier. Not necessarily busy on all the things that I want to be busy on. Uh, so I struggled with uh, a few of the bits that I actually wanted to uh, cover and i'll talk about that briefly because that's going to lead us into the first item um before i begin however is there any news that you guys want to share um i'm probably trying to keep the community and news bit shorter in this particular episode because i want to get into uh the main thing i've got my tea so we're all set my uh, dad dance tea mug the one of my daughters kindly bought me I see Laurie's in hi Laurie please let me know if you're you're there um, and your names um, and I can greet you as well on the chat What's Laurie saying? My current project is another retro computer. Oh, the Amstrad CPC. Damn, yeah, I remember those. Um, at university, my final project write-up was um, was done on an Amstrad CPC. It was a bit of a nightmare. There were three of us doing our write-ups. Uh, some of us shared projects. But... Um, we we're all trying to use this damn thing, and we were up pretty much all night writing this damn thing up. And um, it crashed, and we lost a lot of stuff, and then we restarted it, and it crashed again. Damn, it was a nightmare. But we did eventually manage to get our, our write-ups done and printed out on the Amstrad. Um, so, yeah. I remember those machines. They were great, really, as word processors. Um, 
But it'd be interesting to see what, what software. I'm damned if I can remember what was running on it. It wasn't my Amstrad. It was one of the guys uh, who we shared the house with. Uh, it was also on the course. Um, it was their Amstrad that we, we were using. And I hadn't used one at that point, not until um, we had to do these project write-ups. And the only reason we were using that is because we couldn't get access to the machines um, it, it, in the uni at, at the time because everyone was trying to get on them to get their end of year uh, end of, or end of course projects. Um, you know, the graduation projects done and written up, etc. Ah, oh, DSP 8 bit. Hi, mate. How you doing? Um, I can't remember. Let me just do a quick search, Laurie. Laurie's asking, was it a CPC or a PCW? I can't remember, actually. Let me just check because if I get some images up. Um, uh, CPC. I oh, know. I think it was the PCW actually, mate. Uh, PCW. Let me just get a picture of that. I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, it was probably like one of these. Yeah, that looks about um, right. Hold on. Just so you can all see it. I think that that was the machine that I was using. It was a PCW. The one Laurie's talking about. Uh, I should also bring the. Um, Browser up there, and you can see what I'm looking at. Um, cat. Um, where's my browser gone? There, guys. So that was the uh, PCW. That's what we did our uh, write-ups on uh, for our, before our graduation. There was about three or four of us had to use the same machine. And we all had similar de deadlines because we were all on the same course. Well, that's not strictly true. One of them, uh, one of our colleagues wouldn't. But um, yeah, and uh, the, hold on. Um, CPC looks slightly different. It also had a green screen. So there's a much better picture here, actually. Let me show you this one. That, that, look, that reminds me much more of what it looked like. Interesting detail. CPM Z80 driven. It's definitely a green screen, I remember it. Yes. Um, so the CPC, what does the CPC look like? I'm not familiar with those, I don't think, uh, Laurie. Is that a CPC? Oh, was it? Yes, was it? it did it plug into the uh, TV, Laurie, rather than come with a monitor? Because the uh, PCW is really aimed at business, wasn't it? I guess the CPC was aimed at uh, the gaming market or more consumer market. So Laurie's working on, you know, all the retro projects he's done. He's adding this one in as well now. Uh, he's working on a, um, 
uh, a retro port of this. Let's call pick. Big chunky keyboard and the um, <laughs> the tape deck on the right hand side. I remember on the Spectrum, I think they used the uh, tape deck. I didn't have a Spectrum, I had a ZX81, but my brother had a Spectrum and that had a tape deck on the side as well. Well, it, it was an external one that you plugged in for the audio port. So what was that saying? Amstrad, 64K microcomputer. Basic 1.0. CPC came with a monitor as well. So is that what I'm looking at here in this picture? That was the provided monitor, was it? Oh, and then TV. Even monochrome or colour. So presumably there's games for it as well then. I mean, I'm probably not familiar with it. I never used this machine. So presumably... It's a it, it's a Z80 running CPM. Nori. Nori says he's doing the floppy disk version because it loads faster. Although it won't have a real floppy disk, of course, just an SD card or something something similar. Z80 CPM. Oh, CPM was optional. Do you have to pay more for the CPM then? Or is that licensed with the machine? Just once we're going through that, I'm just going to um, take my top off because otherwise I'm going to end up baking in here with the door closed. I have a new chair as well. Can you see? I can't see because everything's resting on it. And the reason I've got a new chair, by the way, is because the old one squeaked. And the reason that I know it squeaked is um, Matthew Venn interviewed me uh, this week for Yosis HQ. Uh, and among the other issues, he was telling me that maybe my audio could be upped in quality. But one of the things he said was he, <laughs> he kept hearing my chair squeak. So I actually got uh, my chair replaced this week as well. So it should be quieter. It probably still makes a bit of a creaky noise, but it doesn't squeak. It's much more comfortable. That old chair I had repaired many, many times over the year. Um, bolted the back, the back on several times. It had been through quite a lot, but it's quite nice to have a nice new chair. And a nice classy black and white. Um, so Laurie says, no, it was free. The CPM was free um, as an option. Had a bit games library, but not as big as Spectrum. Excuse me. Popular across Europe. DSP 8-bit. I love retro computing not much for gaming but about the technology uh, i had a c64 or a c128 zx spectrum that's dsb 8-bit yeah we, we we like all that stuff especially down on the forums there's a lot of work I, I, i'm pretty sure you know about all the work that was done down on the mystorm forums dsp um they've got all sorts down there including um things like the um, bbc and the atom stuff as well which is kind of cool we like that stuff any other news anyone to share before i move on to the um schedule The weather's been really good here, spring-like, still a bit chilly, but today it turned a bit cooler again, unfortunately. But it's, it's nice, you know, when it's a bit brighter, particularly in lockdown, 
you can get out and have a walk. I'm meeting Ken tomorrow as well, by the way, guys. We're going to take a walk. Which will be good. Oh, yeah. Laurie said, I also played with... Uh, we were trying to work out, was it Silas? Silas? <laughs> what the pronunciation was. We did this at the previous stream. Silas? Uh, so Laurie's been playing with that, which he said is quite fun. So what do you really think, Laurie? I mean, would you use it seriously? What 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 would be the relative advantages or disadvantages compared to the others that you've used? It, this is for creating HGL, by the way, Silas. I should provide a link, really, shouldn't I? Sorry. Being a bit slow today. And then we can all see. Oops. Corrected me. Thank you, Google. Didn't want it corrected. Oh, FPGA, maybe. God, type today. There we go. Here's the uh, link, guys. So, Laurie's saying it's, uh, it's a simpler language than Spinal HDL. <laughs> Probably easier to use than NMIGEN. People seem to be implementing things that are fast with it. Hmm. Like risk five process. Yeah, I remember that. There was a. I think I covered it on uh, one of the news items, the community news items, in one of the previous streams. But is it good enough for you to think of switching? Um, DSP 8 bit was also saying, How was the interview at USS HQ? Um, is it already out public? It's not out slash public yet. Um, I think Matthew's a couple behind. He did an interview with Olaf as well of the sort of fame, uh, and Fossey fame. So, uh, he had to finish editing that one up first before he uh edited ours our interview so uh, I don't have a date or anything I mean I'll let you guys know when you put it out I did blabber on a bit in the middle of it talking about he asked for a brief overview of Xbox because it came up as one of the questions <laughs> and of course I went on for ages too long talking about that but uh, there you go I can't help myself um, Laurie's saying I use a lot of languages well, I've got some news for you today, Laura. You're going to be using a new one, I can assure you, at some point. Um, I'm going to get you into this. But anyhow, um, any other news items before I move on? I'm always finding new stuff for you, Laura. You know me. Okay, so let's move on then. Um, so, yeah, the reason I couldn't stream last week, what it came down to was a problem with, um, uh, have I got a URL? Yes. I had a problem with this. One of these. Um, for those of you that don't recognize what this is, this is a low cost imported, aka Asian version or copy, something that mimics the ST Link. Now, what is the ST Link? Well, there's been a series of different versions of them. 
um, ST as in the semiconductor folks that make things like the STM32 and you'll know that um, I do have a penchant for, penchant for these particular microcontrollers, range of microcontrollers, the STM32s. So one of the low cost ways of programming it is using um, one of these um, that you see here, uh, which is an ST Link version 2 clone, if you like, which can be had um, from lots of different places. In fact, I keep some in stock. I was going to sell them through the Tindy store before we had all these postage problems. I bought a bunch in just in case so I could get, get them out to people that wanted them. And again, that offer will, will still be there. Um, the ST designed their ST Link uh, hardware based around an STM32. Surprise, surprise. Um, normally an STM32103, an M3 Cortex chip, nine times out of ten. So, so it's an external JTAG programmer that supports, in particular, it supports uh, SWD programming, which is two key lines. It's the um, SW clock and the SW DIO, which is data in and out. So it's really just two lines, and then you provide ground and normally reset as well, so that you can remotely uh, reset the, uh, the, the device that you're debugging. So it's a hardware debug system, and normally, you know, on the top two pins on the right-hand top corner, um, you've got the SWD pins. Um, and when you design the board, it's a good idea to try not to use those for anything critical so that you've got access to them. And in fact, um, we break them out, um, and I must show you that actually, uh, on the... Um, ice core board they go down the black edge connectors not only the two swd pins but also the reset line which is quite important um, when you're developing uh you know embedded um products particularly hardware products you know, if you're actually doing that, it's a good idea to be able to connect JTAG or SWD to them. Um, and it's always a good bring up early on to be able to talk to them using the SWD. You can get in much more deeply than you can with something like an Arduino. So if you look at the kind of Arduino way of doing it, what you normally have is you have a very simple program you normally have like a setup uh, um, function and then you have a loop function so it runs the setup first and then it runs the loop and it kind of hides you away from the cleverness that often has to go on when you're dealing with embedded firmware uh, which we will see some of in a bit because that's what we're going to be talking about but the the way that you debug mostly on Arduino, or the way that most people debug, not me, because I'm not really an Arduino expert. I've never really used it much. I mean, I've used it one or two times, um, but I'm not really, um, I don't really, didn't really like the IDE, to be quite honest. Um, but you normally just use like a print statement, which comes back to a serial console. Um, but that's actually quite advanced if you think about it, because in order for you to run something that then uses the UART peripheral in the microcontroller to actually interpret strings that you're sending back to a console on USB assumes that you're running a whole bunch of things. You know, you have to have all of that stuff running before you can even send anything back. With uh, JTAG and SWD, you don't have to assume any of that's running. Um, and often you've got, you, you can actually send, you know, print-like messages over JTAG. It's very slow uh, through a process called what's 
what's known as semi-hosting. Or you can, you know, on, on some of the uh, microcontrollers or and uh, JTAG or debug tools, you've got something called, um, is it IT, ITM, ITMU, is it? ITMU, I'll better check this out. Hold on. ITMU. Yes. No, it's not that one. Let me see if I can find the right thing. JTAG. Hold on. I'm going to need a PowerShell. Let me uh, get that up because I'll have my ITM commands running. Uh, hold on. ITM. I think it's just ITM, isn't it? Difference between ITM and ETM. Instrumentation trace macro cell, obviously very memorable, um, <laughs> but it's a slightly more efficient way of getting um, kind of print console information back um, over SWD and JTAG. It's, it's a bit faster. I mean, the best way is obviously if you've got a UART or whatever or built in USB is to, uh, to, to use that. Um, but you won't initially have that. When you're first bringing up a board, first using the software, you haven't even written all that stuff yet. So you need something lower level. Now, the other thing that JTAG or SWD does for you is um, it enables you to go and look in to the microcontroller itself and step through using breakpoints for example is everyone familiar what a breakpoint is they might not know so a breakpoint is basically you can tell the program to run up to a point where you've told it a, there's a breakpoint and then it will stop so if you've got a real problem uh, on your microcontroller and you're not sure what's causing the bug sometimes what you might want to do is investigate the state at a certain point in the program um, and you can then go in and examine um, memory locations and registers and stuff like that um, it's very very useful to be able to do now everyone uses this because it's it's more in depth but most people in the embedded space will use these sorts of tools particularly if they're bringing hardware up if you're just using Arduino, then you might not be familiar with it, but um, it is useful to know about. I, I can show you some of the basic stuff today, if you like, because um, that's that's the direction that we're going in um, in order to get things configured. I do have a to do list that um, we'll look at in a minute. So anyhow, the, what you normally do in order to use this debugging feature is you need to use you can either if, if you're a debugger, is purchased from a vendor you know like ST link normally they have some software which you install um, or the IDE you're using you know maybe it's something like a keel or Kyle like you know in a lot of the commercial contracts I do I have often have had to use the Kyle IDE um, which is by the way it seems very um, outdated now when you use it but it's an IDE and it's got a built-in debug etc and it supports some of the standard debuggers out there but some of them are very expensive particularly the ones from ARM etc um, so your IDE may have this direct support in and it brings up a window so that you can do set set your breakpoints and examine the registers and do all that kind of thing 
However, if you want to do that just using open source tools, you can do that. Um, there's a program called GDB uh, for debugging. It's used for debugging things that are running live on a PC, for example, if you're running Linux or something. But it can also be used to talk to a, a low level device such as a, a JTAG. And normally with the ST link type devices, what you have to do is a somewhat convoluted arrangement where you have to use a third piece of software called Open OCD. Let me just bring that up. So GDB. Um, that's the project for GDB if you want to know what that is. Uh, it's very, very common in the open source world. Um, and there's a lot of documentation on the internet about how to use it. It's quite simple. I can show you some basic stuff in a bit. Um, and then the other thing I've just mentioned is Open OCD, which you need as well. So let me give you the link for that. Just so that you've got this stuff. Um, again, both of these are open source pieces of software and commonly used um, throughout the open source communities. Um, not just for open hardware stuff, but for a lot of software stuff as well, and particularly for things like embedded Linux development, for example. Um, open on chip debugger was what Open OCD stands for. Um, so anyhow, in order to get the ST link working with GDB, because I want to use GDB to do my debugging, uh, which can work on a command line, by the way, all you need is a terminal for it. You don't need anything fancy like an IDE. Um, but to get the ST link working, you can't have open the GDB talking to that directly. So what GDB does is it talks normally over like a network port, um, you know, like Telnet or something like that, to a, a, an open port on the same machine quite often, or it could be a remote machine. Um, and that then provides the services to GDB. Um, normally what you do is you run open OCD, which will talk low level to the uh, JTAG or SWD device, and then it re, it, it, it re, what's the word, not publishes, it re, uh, it, um, it makes a port, a GDB compatible port available on say, you know, port free, 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 free. That's, that's a common uh, port number. So open OCD really, acts as a piece of software that sits in between GDB and the JTAG device itself. Now, I don't know a lot about OpenOCD and the way it's developed, etc. But I do know through the years, <laughs> it's caused me nightmares, normally because the version I have uh, is too old or whatever, or the one that comes with my distribution is too old and doesn't support the particular JTAG adapter that I'm trying to use. So it's always a big problem for me, and I always end up pulling my hair out. Um, not only do you need to get support, but you also need to set up the commands, etc., to talk to it in order to get um, to get things working well. Um, so, for example, I remember doing it for the MyStorm, sorry, for doing the ice core development. Um, and I remember I did it on this laptop, strangely, um, some time ago for Windows. And that was a nightmare. And I remember having to patch the open OCD software, manually go in there um, and, and change or add support for the STM32F7 because it wasn't supported at the time. And this was often the case, I find, when I try and use Open OCD. And I don't know why, I don't know the politics of it, but I do know that it caused me endless problems. So um, 
I was having big problems with this over the last week or so and that's what prevented me get, getting things working because without this working I couldn't do what I wanted to do on the stream which was go into the firmware side of the uh, the boards that we're doing because it's, it's very important part of the new strategy for the boards that are that are that are coming down downstream let me just check my messages here. Do you ever use Esden's Black Magic Probe, which runs open OCD on the device? It's interesting you say that, Laurie. Um, so I, I, I tweeted actually at some point, at some point last week, um, does anyone have any good recommendations for a decent JTAG, you know, device? I thought, why not? You know, I've spent so much money on kit in the recent months and stuff, just updating my tools and things here just to make things a bit smoother. I thought, well, I might as well spend some money on a JTAG, decent JTAG. Um, and there were two that came back that people really liked. Okay. Um, one was the J-Link, and I'll come back to you in a sec, and the other one was the Black Magic Probe. So it's timely that you ask that, um, Laurie. So what's Laurie saying? I use a custom version of Open OCD with Saxon Sock, but only where there is no alternative. Right. Yeah. So you build in the JTAG hardware into the FPGA so that you can connect it up. You have to use a JTAG interface as well to do that. How does that work? Or do you do it over Raspberry Pi or something? Tom Verview used to use Blackmagic Probe with Black Ice 2. That's interesting. Uh, Saxon Sock has JTAG. Yeah, but did you have to use a, a JTAG adapter to do that? I mean, you can use Raspberry Pi to do these as well, although I've never done that. Um, to act as a hardware device in between the two things. Um, yeah, I use an adapter. What adapter do you use, Laurie? Are you using Blackmagic or are you using like one of the ST-Link type jobbies? The ST-Link ones um, work. It's just they can be a bit painful to set up. And they're certainly very low cost. Um, I mainly use the Lychee Tang version. Send me a link, Laurie. I'll have a look. I haven't seen that one. Um, so the two big winners that came back in terms of what people actually recommended from their own use, because that's important, were um, the J-Link, which I think comes with its own software. But J-Link is um, the normal J-Link. JTAG adapters are very expensive. We're talking 300 pounds upwards. For these but they do do an edu version like an educational version it does everything the others do do more or less but it's it doesn't come with support although you can get support on the forum i believe so this is one of the recommendations holy cow oh, it's one of these horrible links i do apologize let me put that in here so we can see this So this is one of the local RS electronics that we use in the UK. Um, so this device is reasonably priced. You know, it's not in the hundreds of pounds, um, but it's about 50 pounds plus tax. So that was uh, recommended to me. So that's one I'm considering. Um, that seems to be very well rated by people. And they seem to be fairly hot on updates. So that's a possibility. Um, but it's proprietary. The other thing was the um, the Black Magic Probe, which is actually an open source device. Let me show you that. 
And this is from our friend Peter at One Bit Squared. He's had this for uh, some time, actually. I did see it before, but I'd never really looked at it closely. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, in, in his European shop, that's not available. They're sold out. He's had problems making these because of the shortage of STM32s, because the design is based around an STM32103, which is the older Cortex-M3 um, device. Now, as, as uh, Laurie hinted, um, let's just have a quick look what Laurie's pointing out here, because it's... This might be an interesting device. Let's just have a quick look before I go into that one. So that looks a lot like the ST links. Oh, wait a minute. No, this is an FT2232 device, which is commonly used to be very common as a JTAG adapter. So this isn't just SWD. This would probably do JTAG as well, I would assume. Do we give any details? I mean, you can see it's labelled on here TDI, RST, TMS, TDO, TCK. So, yeah, that's JTAG as opposed to just SWD, which is what you get on those low cost Asian um, devices. So, how much do they charge for this one? Yeah, it's £10, so it's not a lot of money. How have you found that, uh, Laurie? I got the uh, I got the Lychee Tang JTAG device because I got the Lychee Tang FPGA board. Oh, we, did you buy them together or something? Or well, that was what was advised to be used with the um, with that board, I guess. And again, the other thing I don't like about this is, is the same as the ST Link is that you've got the connector here. I prefer mine to be on a cable rather than because it's awkward from a wiring point of view, uh, to have it actually shoved into your laptop, for example, or a hub, if you happen to have a hub, if you're mobile, then not. I prefer it on a cable. So, um, it, oh, it's worked a few times that I've used it. Um, DSP 8-bit says, is there a way for using open OCD for software debugging. I recently started trying uh, SWV with STM Cube IDE. Yeah, you can certainly use it within. I, I mean, I'm not familiar with the STM 32 Cube IDE. I know they have it, but I've never used it. But I guess, you know, I mean, it depends what you're trying to program. Don't forget, if you buy one of the like. Um, uh, standard boards that, uh, um, you know, uh, that you get from ST. So, for example, here, this is the uh, STM32F070 uh, Nuclear, which is a larger format board, which has like Arduino headers and stuff on, as well as their own, I forget what they call it. What do they call it? Uh, they call it, um, I can't see on it because there's labels all over the back. Their own proprietary connectors on the outside of the Arduino type connectors, or you can get the um, the really small ones, Hold on. like this, like this one, the tiny ones, which don't, which are just like deep dip, dip based. Um, or you can get the other ones that the ST do a lot of are the, um, here's one I was using recently. This is the old, uh, I know it's a newer version of it, but this is an old discovery board for the STM32 F4 series chip. And it's got a great bunch of LEDs at the top because you can do this compass thing. It's got like a gyro and magnometer and stuff in it, discovery board. But all of them share... Um, so in here, if you look at the top bit, that is a J-Link at the top. So it has an extra STM32 on there that acts as a J-Link. So all of their bores, whether it's the really small, tiny dip ones or the Nucleos 
or the discovery series all come with the ST link built in so that you don't need to use a separate um, JTAG. Of course, when you're bringing up your own hardware, you do need that because you don't build J, you know, JTAG uh, tools normally into the board, although some development boards do come with that kind of stuff on them, for example. So um, the STM Cube IDs will definitely support ST-Link compatible products. Um, they may well support other um, other types of JTAG tools, but they will most definitely support the ST-Links that are on the built into their discovery type products or Nucleos. Um, and you can probably use the Asian clone ST-Links as well. Although, you know, don't quote me on that if it doesn't work. Um, yeah, Laurie's saying what you can do is you can use an extension cable with um, with these here, so it's less of an issue. Um, so anyhow, back to the so the J Link provides an alternative to Open OCD. Um, and then the one bit squared, the Blackmagic probe, um, is different again. So Dispy 8 bit says, yes, I mean, recently I knew about the serial viewer debugging. The newbie in open OCD. Yeah. So the Blackmagic probe is a bit different. So what it does, and what I thought was really cool when I was looking into this, so from these suggestions on Twitter, was um, even though the J-Link was proprietary, I like the idea of the open source board. That's what attracted me towards uh, the Blackmagic Pro. Um, and I haven't ordered anything at this point. I'm just doing with what I've got for the moment. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is I can't get the Blackmagic Pro unless I get it from the States. Um, Peter did do an update actually he did a stream last night and he did mention that he's had problems sourcing the components but I think he's sorted that out now however I don't see any stock yet I need to go back and check um, but the but one thing that's different about the way that the black magic probe works that I thought was really quite cool for me um, given the weird way that I've been developing recently is that it doesn't not normally you have a bespoke um or special class of usb device you know for your jtag adapter um a lot of them use things like the ftdi adapters which come up using ftdi lib whatever or you know lib usb if you're working on linux and stuff but they're very special USB type drivers, right? Um, as is the J-Link as far as I know. But the Blackmagic Probe just appears apparently as a serial port on when you plug it in on the USB. And I thought, oh, well, that's cool. The reason that's cool for me is it means that you can use Windows subsystem for Linux, theoretically because um, serial USB is available under Windows subsystem for, for Linux, whereas the other, you know, more custom USB devices, uh, the operating system doesn't pass through to Windows subsystem for Linux. So you can't easily use them. So you may be asking, well, how on earth do I get that working, you know, with my ST-Link uh, JTAG SWD. Well, well, what I do is I have to run that in Windows. Normally I run Open OCD on Windows, especially compiled version that I've patched that supports the uh, F7. Uh, I run that in PowerShell. And then I get GDB to connect to that port, basically. Um, but that's a bit of a pain, having to use PowerShell. I'd much rather be able to use... Um, 
Windows subsystem for you for Linux. Having to run all these different things is just a pain. So this was quite interesting for me. However, when you go and look, so right, let me see if I can find this now. Um, what's it called? Black Magic Probe. Oh, yes. There we go. So if I bring up uh, because it's open source, you can go and look directly into the software. So I was thinking this would be really good for a Windows subsystem for Linux. That means I, as well as using it on Linux, and I have been using Linux a lot more again recently, going back to it. Um, but I still want to be able to do it. all my streaming setups still on the Windows machine. So I still need to be able to do this on the Windows machine. Which is why I was having a mega nightmare um, getting this thing to run over the last week or so. So if we go and look at the uh, the software for this, what is interesting is um, there's a link by the way, guys. So if you look at the issues in here, I always on open source project I quite often look at issues because they tell you kind of a bit about the project. You know, you can have a look at the number of commits and things like that, but the issues is always a good place to look if you're thinking of using open source software, right? Because you can get a an idea of what sort of state it's in, you know, are issues fixed quickly or do they just hang about like a bad smell for a long time? So when I was looking through this, I noticed, let me see if I can find this now. Uh, here we go so this is interesting so what it says here some may already be following along with the issue that Blackmagic Probe has with you guessed it Windows subsystem for Linux um, with locking up GDB when freshly connected. Ah. So it looks like there's real issues with it. Um, and this was posted last April, last year. So it's, this is nearly a year old, right? Uh, since I found what appears to be a fix, I wanted to bring the issue up here to see if this is something that is both possible and welcome to fix in the... Uh, Black Magic Probe source. Happy to submit a PR if it's something we have control over. It's low enough friction to make a change here on the Windows subsystem for Linux. So that, and if you read through this, you see that they're using it. They've obviously got quite a few users in their organisation using this on Windows subsystem for Linux. So they've they've found a fix. They've created a fix themselves. And they compile a special version of this that they run locally. But the fix hasn't been applied to the uh, to the main software. And the reason is, so the fix for WSL is to comment out this line, which sets the DTR setting. Um, <laughs> they then go on to say, it looks like that line came from... Adava 7, which fixed bug 300 no, 3.3 million, sorry, 3307433 nine years ago. <laughs> no idea what the bug was, since that's not a GitHub issue. So it was obviously well before this stuff was on GitHub. Uh, it'd be nice to get some sort of fix into master that doesn't break some other functionality. Uh, I'm also content maintaining a WSL patch binary for myself and my team's probes. Um, he talks about a Mac problem, but I think that's something different. Um, 
and then what said here any fix for one system seems to stall other systems so we need to really understand the problems other issues are the mac os issue uh, and there is an old issue here can you try after Fres G replug in GDB da 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 on Linux I see anyhow so it's basically unresolved because of this bug fix that obviously happened some time ago um, they don't know what the bug fix was for or certainly the people in this issue Fred don't and no one else has responded about it but if they disable this one line that fixes the problem it causes problems elsewhere so it's a bit of a catch-22 so now I'm just kind of a bit cheesed off really because it's like well yeah it sounded really good because I could go and use it in WSL as well but it sounds like you can't go and use it in WSL unless you patch it um guess what i'm doing i'm already patching open ocd so it, this doesn't really buy me much unfortunately which is a shame because i quite like the idea but i i will keep my eye on this but i thought i'd make a point of um that because it was an interesting conversation anyhow uh, i've still got to make a decision at some point but for the moment i'm just using the jlink but i'd really love to have a solution that just kind of works you know, over the years, I've lost so much time trying to patch these open OCDs and God knows what else software in order to get these damn things to work. Normally, it's because, you know, it's a newer device that we're using, which is, you know, I often use newer devices and the hardware designs. I want to get the best features. So, yeah, and I tend to be ahead of a lot of the, uh, certainly what looks like a lot of the open source software. Um on the JTAG or SWD tooling side. So I'm going to have to think about what I'm going to do there moving forward. Um, and if anyone else has got any other ideas, then let me know or experience of other products. So anyhow, that's where I've been with that. Um, I have managed to get some stuff working here. Um, it does feel rather fragile for me, but it's, it's, it, it enables us to actually do something. That moves us on to our main topic of conversation. So let me get rid of the browser. Turn it off for a sec. Um, so what we were going to do next was we we're going to move on to, you know, this is a nice segue actually, because this is what I was working on in the first place, right? Um, we're going to move on to what I call black crap. I couldn't think of a good name, so this was great. Uh, black, well, you know where it comes from. All our stuff has black in it. Well, lots of the names do. Crab, you'll get in a bit. So um, what am I going to be working on? What am I covering here? Let me explain where I'm coming from. So as I've said, when I started doing the streaming, a lot of what the streaming is going to be about is really um, just the stuff I'm working on or stuff I'm playing with or exploring or whatever. And I've been conscious for a while, and certainly once we've been covering a lot of their PIO stuff, is that uh, one of the areas of the, um, you know, board development that I haven't covered is the software side, i.e. what you traditionally call firmware parts of um, the MyStorm type products. So that's what I'm going to focus on uh, today and moving forward. But it's going to be slightly different uh, than I've done in the past. So let me just switch over now. Um, Uh, 
That's interesting. Bear with me a sec. I can see the source. Uh, I'm using Markdown here like I do a lot. And um, this is a function in Markdown called to do, which is really useful. So I set out a bunch of to do's here. But, oh, there we go. Wow. That was off on one. So this is what I want to try and cover uh, on this particular stream. But I should really give you some kind of background. So um, if you were to look at the current ice storm, sorry, ice storm, if you were to look at the current ice core uh, repository, let me just share you with that. Probably under my repos. Let me just have a look here. So just to remind you, in case you can't remember, or those that may not even have one of these yet. Fluff stuck in this. Uh, this is IceCore, which is actually the system on a module for black ice. So on the bottom you have these connectors and those normally adhere to the black ice MX uh, carrier board, which has, you know, the PMOD, MixMOD connectors on. But all the core stuff, the really interesting stuff is on here. The other stuff's just IO expansion of one sort. Okay, so that's ice core in case you forgot what that is. So when we're looking at the repository uh, here, um, there you see the board. That's um, inside the repository, you'll find a folder. So obviously I've got the CAD design, which is the electronic design, which is done in Eagle, etc. There's also an examples folder, which has some examples that you can run on the board. But in the firmware, you'll find actually the software that's installed on the ice core um, before it's sent out. And this, 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 this basically is the built-in tooling, if you like, that enables you to program the FPGA. Fundamentally, that's what it does. It does a bit more than that. So if you recall, the board itself has two main components. If I show you the picture again, or just hold one up, you will see here, you've got a really large part in the center. That's the FPGA. That's a TQFN144 package. And then you've got a memory chip as well. Uh, at the top here and then below that you've got uh, a microcontroller one of our favorites that's the stm32 f730 in a 64 pin lq fp now the, the running of the show if you like is done by that microcontroller the stm32 and the software for that is what I'm showing you here in the repository. And you can go and have a look at this. It's all open source. The way that that was developed is I used the vendor tools or some of the vendor tools, not all of them. I don't use their IDE uh, like the STM32 cube. That DSP 8 bit uh, mentioned. At the time, I think when I did this, I used a mixture of Vim, which I quite often use as a general editor. And also, I used, um, I did play around with Visual C for some of the later, uh, not Visual C, Visual Studio Code, which is the open source one uh, from Microsoft. Um, 
and you've got actually in that you do have some debug support as well which is what I had to crib from to get this damn thing working uh, this week so basically I use the STM cube software STM32 cube software uh, and I don't know if you've ever seen this but it's very useful uh, I better not run it actually because it's actually STM32 cube MX and what this software does it's not an IDE it actually enables you to set up all of the peripherals that you're going to use uh, on a microcontroller so what you can do is you can bang in the microcontroller part code it then opens up a window and it shows you physically the part and the pinouts etc and then on the left hand side you can choose all the peripherals that you want to effectively enable um, because in the old days you used to manually go in and set the registers you had a very low level um, API it wasn't it was it wasn't really a how and a how by the way is a hardware abstraction layer it was just like a low level register set and that was fine when you had a small number of peripherals it wasn't so good as these devices got more and more sophisticated and there are so many different devices on the STM 32s now um, they decided to design this piece of software that helps you you know choose which devices you want to use on which pins etc and then once you've done that in this kind of nice graphical user program you can then it then tell it to build the project and what it does is it will build a project and it, it supported a number of different IDEs but it also included a make and GCC um, output as well as all the supporting libraries that were required so STM had this hardware abstraction layer set of complex libraries that gave a very high level um, way of bringing these peripherals up in your software um, actually in either C or you can actually use C++ so if you look at the software that I have under the ice um, uh, ice core uh, if you look in the include directory you'll see a lot of the stuff that's come from the um, STM32 hardware um, abstraction layer as well as their own um, middleware and stuff so they've got a CDC class library for example for the USB um, plus you've got in there you've got all of the um, what are called um, CMSIS, that's CMSIS, which are the standard ARM Cortex uh, files that describe all the registers. It's basically a bunch of structs um, that, that enumerate the registers and addresses and stuff. So basically, what the STM Cube software does is it builds all those parts for you, so you've got those, and then you can use them to do your own stuff. Um, so if you look in drivers, um, you've got the ARM SIMSYS stuff and there's loads of different stuff in there covering all the internal ARM Cortex stuff. And then you've got the STM32 stuff, which covers all the uh, uh, libraries for the different peripherals. So if we look at these, we've got an ADC HAL, we've got a CAN bus, uh, you know, let's find something a bit more... Um, uh, common GPIOs so that you can toggle your pins etc and then things like um, you know uh, you've got your power domain stuff for turning peripherals on and off you've got real-time clock stuff timers and UART so all of your peripherals have hardware abstraction layer code so the bulk of this code in here is actually uh, nothing to do with me it's produced by ST and I've used their tools to actually put together things like the setup 
So when you actually look at the code, there's a whole bunch of code, including it outputs a main file for you where it configures all these devices for you so that they're all operational. And then you can then go and write your own bit of code. Um, it is a bit clumsy in that there are sections in here and it says user code goes here. Now you can imagine the sort of problems that you get. So if, if I go and change this code in any way, um, but then have to need, I need to add a peripheral. So I go back to the STM cube software. Then when I, when I tell it to output, it will actually replace the main I had before. Um, there are different options and stuff, but you have to be really careful because you can overwrite what you've done before. You want to keep most of your stuff in separate files. Uh, and then you just call out from the main mostly. Um, that's the way I found. Not only that, but it gives you a whole bunch of files that you don't necessarily use. Um, peripheral files, for example. Let me just check the messages here. So Laurie said, Ice Core firmware never really got finished. The version that supported flash memory is still in USB CDC issue free. Not mass. Oh, yes, so in the branch. No, you're right. Let me remind myself of that. Uh, it's not on the issues, is it? Can't remember what the issue was. So there is a limited flash functionality. Um, so we can we could store a program in Flash, but we couldn't write arbitrary parts to the Flash, which is something that I think Laurie wanted. Never supported writing software binaries to Flash. Well, the second USB was a real problem. There was a hardware issue with that, and also um, there's an issue to do with DMAs and stuff as well when you enable the... Uh, the second USB. So yes, there were issues with it. But anyhow, so the whole thing, so if you go and look at it, you will see uh, it's probably all in the mice storm area. So I use C++ um, and for example, if you go and look in the um, mice storm file, you can see some of this code here that was written. Um, so we're being called setup from the main here, um, where we're setting up the flash status and the programming status. What makes it complicated as well in this case is the way that the SPI and the flash um, between the two, the FPGA device and the STM32 is wired, makes it very difficult. In the new boards, that's not gonna be like that. Um, that's caused an awful lot of problems from a software point of view or firmware point of view. And then you've got all your library support um, here. And then if you wanted to go and use this yourself, because you wanted to program the STM32 to do something and maybe interact with the FPGA, then you'd go and put your code here in this loop section. So it was possible to do that. However, you had to jump through a few fiery rings in order to do that. Also, SPI to FPGA never got official. Yeah, so that's basically. So, say I wanted to talk to the FPGA and exchange information through uh, an SPI interface. It's already there. Um, it's just we never really went anywhere in terms of. I mean, there, there is an example that, because there's an Arduino version of this as well, there is an example that works there that uh, Richard did. Um, but in the main firmware, it wasn't there. But anyhow, the point I'm making here is this was all written using the STM32 stuff um, and using C slash C++. Uh, and it was a bit of a nightmare and it used to drive me absolutely insane especially this round trip whenever I wanted to change anything and it got to the point actually where it was almost impossible to change it without breaking it every time I'd go back into the STM cube software 
and change something, it will break my stuff and the libraries. And I had to do all these awful patches with the USB part of the HAL in order to get it work. And it just, it, it was just insanely complicated in order to do this. But that's primarily because of the way that the STM32 software environment is set up. It's not designed to be operated in this way, you know, in a kind of open source way. It's designed, you're meant to be using their tools really to do this or their, the supported IDEs or the officially supported IDEs. So it was always a bit of an uphill struggle for me. And for a long time, I mean, originally what Ken and I wanted to do was not use the STM libraries, STM32 libraries at all, or the ST libraries. We actually wanted to use open source libraries. But the chips that we chose, we found when we tried to use the open source libraries, they weren't properly supported. Only parts of the peripherals were supported. Um, and meanwhile, you know, we'd made the hardware um, and we needed to get support out there. So we kind of took this kind of compromise route of using the ST tools in order to get something out that worked. But I was never really happy with the way that that um, worked. And it was certainly not what I expected to do initially. So um, for the new boards, we have an opportunity to start afresh. So I spent quite a long time looking at this and I had some ideas about the way that I wanted to take things. So um, the whole point of talking about this on the stream is to introduce, uh, not really talk about the problems I've had with the previous tools. Um, I mean, Laurie knows full well what those problems are and the issues that that's caused, but more to talk about the way forward and actually start that process interactively. So even though we've got um, a lot of the hardware design uh, in process, we don't have any of the new hardware. So what I'm going to do just to start the software process is I thought what would be a good idea is to actually start working on what we're going to need uh for these new boards but actually just to start that exploration is actually use um or target the um the ice core temporarily now the reason that this will work or partially work i mean there are issues going this route we won't be able to do it fully because the ice core board is somewhat different from the way that the new hardware is written. Okay. Oh, sorry, the new hardware is designed. You know, the way things are connected aren't the same, for example. But there are certain commonalities that we're going to need that will probably operate, or at least in a temporary, from a temporary point of view, that will actually operate with the ice core. That means that you can actually start using this um, if you've got um, a black ice MX. And that's fairly important because that means that we can actually not only start on developing the software support for these boards, but we can actually start playing around with an existing product. So what is Black Crab? But well, that's the name I've given to this new software. Um, I've got some quite interesting plans of how I'm hoping to bring all the various parts together to make this more integrated. So one of the things that isn't good right now is the integration between the heterogeneous parts of this. Um, when we started off the, well, the first board was actually called a MyStorm board, not Black Ice. The Black Ice name came later. Um, when we first, the first boards that we did back in 2016 for the Osh Camp workshop, they were actually called MyStorm boards. 
Now, the decision we made early on was not to use an FTDI product to do the USB interface to the FPGA, which is the way that um, a lot of people went. Certainly, if you look at the lattice tools, that's what they do. They bung on an FTDI JTAG <coughs> type arrangement. And we didn't want to go down that route. There's two, two reasons we didn't want to go down that route. One is we don't like the FTDI tax. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and at the time, the FTDI chips to do that were very expensive. Secondly, there's a whole bunch of other things that aren't covered in the tools or the dev boards that we'd seen around at the time. So, for example, you know, we, we didn't see good mixed signal support. And we thought this was critical. So it became obvious to us that rather than actually putting an FTDI chip on there to do the programming of the FPGA, we could use a microcontroller. Its job would be to program the FPGA, manage the flash perhaps, and also <coughs> provide additional services. And there are a number of different things that we thought it could provide. The obvious one was analog to digital conversion. So in other words, you could, if you did something in the FPGA, it could talk SPI to the microcontroller, which could then deliver the ADC signals back. So that was one way of looking at things. The other things it could do is it could manage things like the SD card, um, which use up a lot of resources when you're doing it on the FPGA. And it's fairly trivial for the microcontroller or a decent microcontroller to do that. Uh, and pretty soon we realized actually it's really a good heterogeneous solution. So you've got the microcontroller and the FPGA. If only you could get the uh, the things to work in a way that were, you know, simple enough for people to actually program. One of the problems that you have, if you put a soft core inside the FPGA, the soft core is probably only going to run maybe at 70 megahertz, something like that, depending on which FPGA you use. There is a limit to how fast that's going to run. Not only is it slow in that sense, but it's also very expensive because it uses a lot of your FPGA resources. Now, given that we don't target the high end FPGA, FPGA stuff, you know, the big Xilinx chips that have, you know, near infinite numbers of resources, the resources within the FPGA are very, very critical and using them as well as you can um, is a good policy for our target audience. So we always thought that. And I came to the conclusion that there should be some way of doing this so that you can take advantage of having a von Neumann core in terms of the microcontroller to do your von Neumann code, you know, using a hard core that's designed to do that and can do that well, without stealing resources from the FPGA and can do it with probably a lot less power. Um, it always struck me is if we can find some way of making that work. Not only could it do that, but it could provide some of the base peripherals as well. Analog to digital conversion, for example, digital to analog conversion, uh, SD or MMC type card support. Um, you know, on some of them, you can even support Ethernet and things like that as well. But a lot of the peripherals are already there, SPI, UART, I squared C. So any of that stuff you don't really need to reinvent in the FPGA if you've already got that in your microcontroller. But making these things work together is not straightforward. So one of the things that I really want to make easier is to provide an environment where that is much more feasible. Um, so um, that's going to be one of the big areas of development in Black Crab is actually making that happen. And it's not trivial, but I think most of the base stuff is now out there that will enable us to sew the various pieces together to actually make this work and therefore make the software much, much stronger to go along with these boards. That's my key aim. Um, so I see a lot of work on that front, uh, a lot of commitment on the software front uh, with that this year. 
So I think probably one of the things that we should do is actually start doing it on the stream as well so that you guys can see what's going on. Maybe even some of you can chip in and help if you see this. Um, so the question is how we do that, right? What's the best way of doing that? Um, there are different components that have different parts. And I don't want to go into the individual components too much at this point. Um, I've, all, I've already covered things like Enmigen. Um, and we need to go back and revisit that part. That solves certain, um, certain parts of this issue. Okay, It doesn't support them all. Um, one of the other possibilities is doing something like running MicroPython on the microcontroller and that's certainly a possibility um, i've shown how that can happen however um, and some people might not like what i'm going to say about this um, python is great for certain things and it's really easy to get into so it's great as a let's do this let's do this quickly however it is highly resource intensive in order to run micropython you need to have lots of ram on your microcontroller, and more importantly lots of rom i mean you really need about uh, half a megabyte of rom to run micropython or circuit python so when I'm talking about MicroPython here, I'm also talking about CircuitPython. Um, also, when using it, I found it was really f a bit flaky uh, when using things like the CircuitPython, the storage device type side of that. Um, again, it's great for getting in there and getting started. It's a great abstraction that's high above, but it has issues. Uh, and it's also not my favorite language, even though I have to use it a lot. I, I think we're going to be using Python in one form or another, but I don't necessarily want it to be the main core of what I'm doing. Now, the other thing is when you're using NMIGEN, so even though it's good, it's programmatic, again, it's still Python. I do find it highly verbose sometimes, and it drives me nuts how verbose it is as a way of describing the hardware. So I think there can be improvements there. But I think when it comes to describing devices, you've got two choices really that make sense in our environment with these boards. One is Verilog, which is good. It's a lot less verbose. If you know what you're doing, if you're repeating, you know, rinsing and repeating stuff that's been done before, building SPI peripherals, I squared C peripherals, dealing with you know led drivers motor drive all of that's fairly easy to do in verilog you know or you can replicate that in emigen very easily and make it almost menu driven how many ports do i need that support pwm how many ports do i need that support steppers etc you can make it formulaic and that's where i'd like to take the kind of protocol or interface to the electronic side of that is to automate that as much as possible so that we don't have to keep reproducing those rules. So that will be a set of libraries, if you like, unless you need to do something specific, in which case you write that piece. Then there's the other piece. So there needs to be an interaction between what's running on the microcontroller and what's running in the FPA. There needs to be some sort of bridge there. Um, and we need some sort of transparency. So depending what that connection is going to be, and it's going to be different in different boards. You know, we can have at the higher level, we can have an FMC interface, which is a, you know, a, a memory controller type interface. So if you look at the amalgam boards, that's exactly what we're designing in. So that gives us a nice high bandwidth interface between the microcontroller and the FPGA, but it uses an awful lot of pins. And if you want to do a low cross board, that doesn't make sense. Particularly if your FPGA doesn't have a lot of pins, right? So, you know, on the lower end, that's going to be Octo Spy, Quad Spy, or just simply Spy as an interface. So whatever we do is got to be able to work with both of those. 
but we need to abstract some of that away between the two things. And then inside I envisage an interface to whatever that is to abstract it. And then some sort of uh, bus inside the FPGA. So that then connects all of the protocol stuff, just like you would if you were doing a system on a chip. Um, the only difference is you don't have your, you know, uh, von Neumann part inside the FPGA. It's external, either using FMC or Quad SPI or something to talk to that bus. But there is a standard set of plug-in parts on the inside of the FPGA for the protocol stuff. And then what you're left with is either the proprietary protocol interfaces to your electronics, which may be specific, although we want to cover most of them anyhow. We could also include something like a PIO equivalent so that you didn't actually have to create the uh, um, the HDL to start with. You could use PIO to program that if you want or something similar. That's an interesting option. But in the middle, you've got all the gluey bits, right? What do you make? You, what, what you need in the middle is something that is capable of describing a lot of the streaming stuff, the manipulation, particularly if you start, you know, when, you, when we look at the higher end stuff that we're going to be doing with cameras and things like that and robotics and stuff, you've got a lot of image processing type stuff. That needs to go on so you need to be able to have streaming architectures uh, and in order to do those you're going to need you don't want to be designing that stuff in uh, Verilog it's a really bad way of doing it you probably don't want to be doing that in MMIGEN because MMIGEN is just too verbose it's not really designed to deal with uh, you know that higher those higher level abstractions i have had a play around and thought about well can i write something that uses this but i haven't had any success really with that um so there's a bit in the middle there and that bit in the middle is normally fulfilled um in the fpga world by what's called high level synthesis okay but most of the high level synthesis that I've seen doesn't really fit in this environment. However, there is some stuff that I've been experimenting with and looking into that may well do this. And I will come back round to that part uh, a number of streams in the future when we're ready for that. And when I have some good example stuff and base stuff done that will work that I can show you. But, so that's that kind of core part. That is essential for making all this stuff work, right? Getting that bit right. But I believe that we will be able to do that come the summer or whatever. Um, there's a lot of glue that has to go around and make everything fit in this because we've got lots of different components there. Um, but I can see light at the end of the tunnel. Now, the other thing I want to do is on the microcontroller side is I want to use an open source approach. I don't want to tie myself into using things like vendor tools. Um, that was a mistake doing that last time, you know, with the STM stuff. Not only because I don't want to tie myself into a vendor, uh, it's nice to be able to choose um, different von Neumann chips, if you like, different microcontrollers for this. I want that flexibility in the future. And some of them that I'm looking at are not STM products. I do like the ST products, don't get me wrong. And it's likely that I'm going to continue to use them. Um, but it might not always be that. So it's another good reason not to have vendor specific tools in the chain rather have open source tools. Um, there's another element of this as well. Um, I probably talked about things like concurrent sequential programming. I've had, I've used lots of different models and compute models 
over the years for different projects, both commercially and open source. And I found some things that work really well and other things that work less well. Um, and language is often a barrier um, to how you program good solutions in the embedded space and it's difficult. And if you're dealing with something that is heterogeneous, like we are here, heterogeneous meaning there's a mixture of technologies in there. You know, you've got the von Neumann architecture and then you've got the FPGA logic architecture. Marrying those things together and having the right models that enable that to work is important. And I think the only way that we can do that is yes, you could possibly do it in Python because Python is one of these designless programming languages, if you like. It isn't fixed on any particular design. You can do all sorts of different designs inside Python, right? However, that also makes it slightly less opinionated and slightly more difficult to do anything well. And things like type support drives me nuts. I much prefer to have type support when I'm doing my embedded work. Uh, types, language type support has saved my lives, life on a number of occasions. Uh, but also having flexible models is important. And the reason I mentioned the Exmos stuff earlier when I was having been interviewed by Matthew Venn is one of the people, he, Matthew on Twitter asked if anyone had any questions to ask me. And one of them was from a guy that I used to talk to a lot on the Exmos forums called Oliver. And he said, do you miss XC? You know, before you went off playing with these FPGA things, because I was doing a lot of Exmos work and I was trying to get their stuff all open sourced. At the time and I had commercial projects in that area as well. Now Exmos used a concurrent sequential processing model. I won't go into the history, you'll get lost in that. And it had a version of C called XC. So this this was C that was extended to support concurrency uh, based on the communicating sequ sequential processes computing model that Tony Hoare developed in I think the late 70s, early 80s. At Cambridge and it was very powerful that is probably one of the best experiences that I ever had in developing an embedded product because of that model it made things we steamed through that project because the model worked so well even though it was an extremely complex robotics project with lots and lots of moving parts and a relatively small team of people so um, I learned a lot from that. So I want to be able to do something that's equally as powerful, but has some base module uh, and models that work in this environment. So um, something uh, about five years ago, I was working on, strangely enough, an XMOS device that was basically a USB based uh, network interface into an embedded system um, and at the time um, I discovered uh, the Rust language which was up and coming then it was being developed and I was looking for something to use just to write the test sequences for this particular uh, device I remember doing it over one Christmas and um, I remember working in this uh, an office it was a colleague's office actually and there was hardly anyone there they were off but I was working over the holidays to get this thing done uh, and I used Rust which is a interesting programming language it's actually a low level system programming language and uh, it was really interesting language and I really liked it however at that time it was very immature it's still being developed and I'd long thought about returning to Rust uh, as a language. So one of the things I've been looking at for the last uh, year or so is, can we, can I use Rust to solve this problem? Now I believe that that is possible to do. There are some caveats here and I may fall flat on my face trying to achieve them, but I think it's possible to actually do everything that I'm talking about 
by using Rust as a primary language. So developing the firmware parts of this, I want to do in Rust as well. So I don't want to use C moving forward for developing the microcontroller side of the thing. I actually want to use Rust. Um, I think it's now mature enough to be able to do that. Now, I know I'm going to hit problems and issues with this. I've spent a good few months looking into the various different things that are available. And there are clearly still issues in terms of support. Uh, and going this route will mean more work for me. Um, but most of the main parts I think we need are either in place or will be in place in the time frames that we need to make this work. So I'm making this executive decision um, to explore a solution based around Rust. And that's what Black Crab is. Um, the Crab, by the way, is they have a thing, uh, they have a like a logo of this little orange crab. Um, I think he's called Ferris. Now, in the Rust community, um, lots of people riff off the Rust um, idea. So you see lots of things like the conference is called, one of the big conferences around Rust is called Oxide. Uh, there's a big consultancy, uh, not a big, a small consultancy that's very, very, very knowledgeable called Ferris, for example. So you, you see people riffing on that. So I thought that that's where the crab came from in the black crab name. Uh, I thought I'd take something from the Rust, uh, Rust environment here, just because I couldn't think of a name. So let's put two words together. Black, well, we know where that comes from. You know, black ice, black edge, etc. The crab part, that comes from Rust. So um, what I wanted to do is actually... Um, start some of that work on the stream and then cover more of this as we go forward um, of the people on the stream just out of interest have you heard of rust you guys or are you familiar have you used it let me know in the chat I'd be very interested. And what do you think of what I'm doing here? Of going this route. To me, uh, Rust is actually uh, a really nice language because it gives us the benefit of C, i.e. low level stuff. But uh, we can produce much safer code, actually. That's one of the things that Rust is good at the way memory and stuff is handled, the way that you do concurrency. The language is much stricter in terms of what you do. So a lot of the places where you fall over um, in C are not possible in Rust. The compiler does a lot more work and a lot more checking for you to prevent a lot of those issues. But it is actually a rich language as well. It has much more modern parts to it. Um, I mean, C++ has lots of modern parts, but trouble is C++ has become everything to everybody. So much has been added over the years. The whole thing is just enormous now. Uh, and I just don't find it natural anymore. Um, Rust does have some attitude about certain things, i.e. certain ways of doing things that I think is very nice. Um, but more importantly, Rust will support certain models that I like as well. Um, what, what's quite common in Rust is things like the actor pattern, um, but you can also do communicating sequential processes as well. There's lots of different things that you can mix in, but it's actually got some very powerful language constructs as well. Um, let's just see. So what are people saying? Uh, Laurie saying, been looking at Rust a bit recently. And concepts like borrowing, but never really used it. 
yeah borrowing is just kind of a safe way of other things being able to access a common piece of memory so there are some constructs that you have to get your head around um, although the documentation now is so much better than when I looked at it five years ago, although I did nothing in between on Rust, I may add, I'm almost coming back to it new. Um, so forgive me through the streaming where I cock it up entirely, uh, which I am bound to do. But um, I'm learning as I go along as well on this front. Um, to me, it is quite a pleasure to use. Um, so what I figured we'd do is actually just start diving in. Um, I'm probably going to trip myself up a lot on this, so I've already seen a lot of problems. But let's just dive in anyhow. Um, so in terms of what I thought that we would do, uh, let me bring that up here. Let me get rid of the browser because we don't need that. By the way, um, there is a site... for Rust. And I should give you that. Um, if you want to learn it, it's very easy. Um, there's some great, um, they have like Rust books. So you can actually just learn it on your system, whether that's Windows or Linux. Forget the embedded side for a moment. Just get your head around the language to start with. Um, just read the book. And you'll see it's very well set up. I think I've, I've been really impressed going back to it. It's so much better than it was when I left it all those years ago. Um, you can see it on the screen here, the Rust programming language and it gives a very good breakdown it's very easy to follow through there is a lot to take in a lot of the stuff you won't need to start with and in the embedded sense a lot of it is um i wouldn't say surplus to requirement but you know there are levels that, that you need to use and there are levels which are unnecessary let's say um, but it's very powerful do take a look they also have, um, there's lots of stuff on the embedded front as well. Um, not sure where to point you on this because I've had mixed experiences on the different things that I've used. Um, one way is to perhaps, um, if you've already got a black ice MX, then you can use the ice core. What you will need probably is um, one of these ST link things, but let me know if that's the case. I can, you know, send you one of those for a few quid uh, if you're really stuck, or you can buy them on eBay or Ali or whatever um just to get things sorted and i can give you all of the configuration stuff um, it won't be half as painful for you guys as it has been for me um <laughs> i've done most of that pain and also you can follow along if you want which is kind of cool alternatively you can if you want advice on choosing like a, a kit that's got some support um for embedded rust then let me know i've tried a few of them um but as usual these things get get a bit stale um so when they stop making the boards or the board change they don't always update the software so you know on, on the embedded side um the documentation isn't as um reliable i'd say there's quite a bit out there you have to do a lot of detective work I'm finding, but anyhow, we'll, we'll, we'll cover some of that, but um, do have a look at the language, see what you think of the language, because if you don't get on with the language, then you're not going to get on with using it in an embedded environment. So it's really important to get your head around the basic language stuff. And there are some challenges with that. Um, 
you know, dealing with the way that they've handled the memory um, isn't as straightforward as C. But the reason it's done that way is to prevent you completely shooting yourself in the foot. So the memory model that's used is much more sophisticated. Uh, and by the way, when I was working with the Exmos concurrency stuff, they had different ways of dealing with the memory as well. Not quite as sophisticated, I would say, as what Rust have done here. Rust have really fought out the models and how they're, um, they're represented. And it's really worth getting your head around that part of it. Very important. Um, so my current experiences are with using this in embedded albeit limited because I've only just got back into it recently is I really like it but it is a bit different you know there are going to be some surprises there's going to be some scratch head scratching and etc etc but it is producing you know stuff that works and that's that's key to me and one of the other lessons I've learnt in life is you know sometimes you have to take some risks if you want to move the dial you know if you want to move forward um and i like to be able to skate to where the puck well where i think the puck is going to be rather than just follow you know uh the safe route every time um and going down the you know the rust boulevard here or the rust fork um is me skating to where I think the puck's going to be. Uh, and I think you'll see over the next, you know, however many streams as we get into this, that um, uh, I think it's a good route to travel. And I think we can do all the things that we need to do, quite frankly. And it's enjoyable. And I think there's some really, really cool people in the Rust communities as well. And some super smart people, believe you me, mind-blowing smart people uh, that know this stuff so much better than I do. So um, let's have a look at what I've got on the list here. So let me just kill that browser and let's get on with, let's deal with setting up a... Um, Oh, that's really strange. Why is that black on my screen? Can you not see the to-do list? Hmm. If I go to the source, can you see that? There's the source. That comes up. But when I go to the preview, can't see that. I can see it here, but you can't see it in the window on OBS. Right, I'll stick with the source markdown for this. So here are the things that I wanted to try and cover today if we've got enough time. I do apologise, we're already a couple of hours in. It may be a bit late to do all of this. Um, I notice we've lost a few people. Um, but I'm willing to continue if you guys are. Let me know what you think. I just realised I'm leaking. Here as well. My drink's leaking. Right, so let's kick off then quickly. Let's see how much we can do. Um, Laurie's okay to continue for a while. So I'll do a little bit more. So the first thing is, um, by the way, I should give you a URL, shouldn't I, for this? Uh, hold on. Uh, all the stuff I'm working on, uh, I have a repository, so I should give you that. Uh, 
that's here. We just show you that briefly. That's this repository here, you can see. So you can download all the stuff. Uh, as I as I commit it, really. So I'll try and commit everything I've done at the end of every uh, stream, so that you can access it and all of the critical files that we need, etc. Um, so if you look at what's in here. Um, all I've got at the moment is the to do markdown, which you can see there on my screen. There's a readme and a license, and there's a git, git ignore. So we need to set this stuff up. So the first thing we're going to do, let me just get rid of the um, browser again so we can look at the code window. So in my terminal window, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm actually in the directory here of this. I'm going to do um, an initialization in the current directory. So Rust comes with a really nice tool called Cargo. And Cargo is great because it can do things like manage all your libraries and help you manage your projects. It can build your projects. It can run your projects. It can get the packages you need for your project. So it's a great tool. Um, and Rust comes with this built-in uh, package management. They use a thing called crates, which are really just libraries. And Cargo can help you do that. So the first thing we're going to do on our list here is initialize this directory with Cargo. So let's do that. Uh, that's very important. I wonder if I can then refresh this. Uh, so straight away now we've got uh, a source directory and a main rs file and i'll open those in a second there's also a file called cargo.toml um, and this is like an ini file really and this um, this is basically where all your dependencies are uh, documented okay so the different libraries that you want you need to enumerate in this file uh, we'll come back to that in a minute but in order to do our debug setup we're also going to need a few other bits and bobs so um, this is now initialized with um, cargo so I can actually go and Let's just tick that one off, actually. Done that. Um, we need to add our cargo config. So here I need to make a directory. This is used internally by cargo. Um, I just assume, I better check actually, because the file view doesn't always show you. Yeah, it's not there. So I'm just going to make a directory here. And I'm using Windows Subsystem for Linux in this terminal window, by the way. Um, there's nothing special about this. Um, and I'm going to make a dot cargo directory. And I'm going to touch a file, create a file in there called uh, What am I going to call it? I need to call it config. And this will basically determine how this particular cargo project is being built because we're, we're having to do some slightly different things here in that actually what we're doing is we're building a effectively a cross compiled project. Because I'm running this on a PC, but what I'm building for is an ARM target in terms of the STM32, the ice core in this particular case. So we're going to need to 
tell Rust about that. Um, I'm, so Laurie's asking, um, what am I using? Is it VS Code? You can use VS Code. There's good Rust support in VS Code, I believe. I'm not currently using that. Um, I'm using PyCharm. And that may sound ironic because this most definitely is not Python, right? But uh, PyCharm is based on IntelliJ's IDE that they use. They use it for their, they have a C Lion, which is C, C++ based tool. They have a Java, IntelliJ, uh, Java based environment that deals with things like Java and Scala and those kind of things. And then PyCharm is really like the version of it they've turned with all the Python libraries in. But they also do a bunch, they've been developing a bunch of Rust libraries as well recently. So all I've done is I've just installed the Rust plugins. That's really useful when you're getting started with Rust because there's a lot of libraries and things um, and it will give you um, some insight into um, some inline insight into that. I've also got things like a Tommel plugin that supports the Tommel format. So yeah, it's basically I've installed PyCharm and then you need when if you go to the plugin settings, you need to go and install the Rust plugin and the Cargo or Tommel plugin. I can't remember what it's called. Um, so I'm going to need to set up the uh, Cargo config file here. So I'm going to open that. And I know what needs to go in here. As I say, I've already done a lot of this work, so it's going to save us quite a bit of time. So I'm going to put a bunch of stuff in here that I know we're going to need. Okay. So the most important thing here is the target. So the instruction set that we're targeting here is ARM based. Uh, in this case, the board that's on the ice core is an STM32 uh, F7. Now that is based on the Cortex M4 M7 um, chip from ARM. So what we're saying here is we're defining what that instruction set target is. There is a number of different ARM instruction sets. In this case, what we're using is it's based around the ARM FUM7 um, instruction set, but we've also got in there, we've got the hardware floating point support as well, because in the M4s and the F7s, and the H7s, by the way, you've got hardware floating point support. So you want to be able to, when, you, when you're doing your compilation, you need to be able to take advantage of that. So that's what we're saying here. There's normally a few different options there's, there's some that don't actually support things like floating port. So if you're using a Cortex M3, Cortex M0, for example, you wouldn't want the floating point performance. Okay, so that's what it's saying, build here. It's saying that the target is basically an ARM device with floating point support. Okay, um, and for that up here, it's also saying this is how we're going to run this. So when we want to run the program that we've written, what does it need to do? So here I'm using GDB to do the running. Now remember GDB was our debugger uh, software that I pointed out earlier. Now there are different names for this depending on what you've got installed. But the instructions I followed always resulted in this being called GDB multi-arc. That's the command. Okay. And then all I'm saying here is I'm passing in some options. The TUI option I may turn off because that's not as good on Windows. But basically, um, the TUI option enables you to split your user interface so that you have a kind of code debug window as well as the normal command line debug controls in separate windows. And I can show you that as well. Let me just make size different here. Uh, the other thing that I'm passing in is the instructions for GDB on startup. And we'll create those instructions in a minute. Um, and this just talks about the linker here, really, on the compilation. These are just standard Rust flags in this sense. 
these are just copied and pasted okay so that's the first thing so let's just go back to our to-do so we've added the cardo config uh, which you do need to do um, we need the open OCD config so again we've got open OCD GDB and open OCD config as well which can be used so I'm going to create those so um, Let's create these files here. And those can be created on the top level. Let's create them both actually. Oops. Soft. Let's open those up. All right, so let's look at the first one here. So, um, there is a tricky bit with this. Hold on. Let's see if I can find my copy of this file. I'm just going to keep this very simple. Um, my open OCD uh, configuration here is very simple for the moment. It just initializes it and resets it every time it runs. Okay. Now, I'm running open OCD in a separate terminal window using PowerShell. And with that, I'm passing in a larger open OCD config file that I've taken from the ice core uh, firmware that I used for that. And I'm, I can share that as well. I should really bring that into this project maybe at some point so you can see that. I don't want to bring it in quite yet because I don't want it to interfere with what I've got here. It might cause a problem. So let's just keep this simple for the moment. So this is very simple. So it just initializes OpenOCD and resets the device, uh, gets the device ready. Then for the GDB configuration, um, I just have it do something very simple. And I'll explain this. So all I'm saying here is target remote colon 3333. All that's doing is saying connect to this port because that's where OpenOCD is running. So it remotely connects to OpenOCD. If I was using the black J-Link, this would be this would say something different because it has its own server that's not open OCD. It's a J-Link server and it uses a different port number. If I was using Black Magic Probe, I'd use something like uh, tar and then the you know forward slash dev forward slash ACM C0 or some such um, to connect it to the port. Um, Etc. But basically, this bit it tells it GDB what it's going to connect to in order to talk to a JTAG device. The load statement literally takes that ELF file that's produced from the build process and loads it into GDB and also onto the device. Break main really just puts a breakpoint at the main start of main for Rust uh, in this case um basically so it gets us into the main um and then continue just means run until that point okay so it's a very simple file none of these are particularly complicated um but you may have to learn something about some of those so where are we now so we've done the 
config here. Let's tick that off. And the reason I'm doing this, I mean, I could have set this up before because I have done it before, is um, you can download like uh, Cortex M Quick Start uh, versions that already have some of this stuff in, but it's not always what you want. And I want to do it piece by piece here if I can to make it easier if anyone needs to retrace the steps. Um, so we've configured those two now as well. That's good. Let's just save that. The other thing I should do is add these in. Now there's a lot of files that have been added. So let's add these into a git config. Uh, and this is the main file which we're going to in a bit that was created with the cargo in it. Uh, we need to make sure that the this is added in. I'm just adding all these files now. That I've just added, making sure that Git knows about them. I know I'm doing them individually. That's probably unnecessary, but there you go. That's good. We've got all those base files. Let's go back to our to-do list. Uh, I need a memory file, so I need to uh, create that. So and this is for the linker because it needs to know the um, memory configuration. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste this actually. So let's touch that. Is it dot X? I think. Yeah. That I should call. Yeah. Let's just leave it like that for the moment. Uh, and this will be particular to the uh, F7. So let's just. Add this into Git as well so that we're tracking that one. And then let's open that up. Okay, it's just a text file. And then we're going to put this in here. So this is for the STM32 uh, 730 devices. Okay. So basically, here I'm just telling it that we've got 64K of ROM or flash. Um, and then, you know, we've got a, there's 176K plus there's an extra 16K. That 16K is slightly different. I think um, parts of it can be kept for sleep and things like that. It's the way that it's, it's divided. You don't need to worry too much about that at the moment. So we're now looking quite good in terms of the files. Uh, the cargo.toml was already added when we did the init from cargo so i don't need to worry about that we're doing well for time here actually this is good um we'll fall over though now right so what i haven't done is put the pieces in place for um the libraries that we're going to need so um, let's have a look at the main file here, which is the code. In this case, this is the code that was generated by cargo in it. OK. Um, obviously, this is not going to be any good for us. For the simple reason that this is just like a regular cargo um, Rust project that's going to run on your normal operating system like a PC or Linux. OK, so um, what we need to do is we actually need to um, make some changes um, in order to do um, an embedded program. One of the things that we're going to need to do is we're going to have there's a couple of things that we need to put in um, 
I'm just going to copy some common ones that I've used and found in examples. Um, these are like macro commands or commands to the, if you like, the pre-compile stage. Um, let me go through these. Um, the warnings and unsafe code thing just enable us to um, prevent compilation uh, in the cases where we've used something like an unsafe piece of code. I won't go into that now. Rust has this idea. So if you've got something that is unsafe, that doesn't follow its memory model, etc., then you can mark off an area of your code and call it unsafe. Now, you shouldn't really need to do that, but there are cases where you do need to do that. So if we were to do that, this would actually prevent us from compiling. And then the warnings also. So if, if, if we're being warned about something, that again is enough for it to prevent us compiling and building properly. Uh, the no main means uh, we don't normally start from main on the embedded program. A bunch of stuff has to go on beforehand. Now that's complicated because normally in a Rust program, you'd have a prolude that includes the standard library. Now that standard library is too big to be used for a lot of uh, embedded programs. Just in the same way, when you're using C in an embedded um, circumstance, you don't want to import the standard library because it is massive in many cases and you don't need all of the stuff. So um, here we're saying that there's no standard library. That has a knock-on effect in that the way that main is handled is slightly different as well. Take these ones on pat for the moment. There are good bits of documentation about these um, these settings. Um, and then our basically what we do um, is we have. Um, a main that is slightly different. So I'm going to get rid of this. And what we need to start with is we need a uh, we need to tell Rust where we're going to start because it doesn't assume main because it doesn't have standard. So we have to mark this off. OK, so we can do that using this. Okay. And then we can do define our main and fn is just really function. Um, and then we need our functional arguments, which in this case is empty. And then we need to tell it um, it's a very type, uh, strongly typed language. But in many, oops, in many cases, it can actually um, assume the type. It can tell what type you're going to need. So it's actually quite crafty in that way. So let's just tell it. Um, oh, what do I need to tell it? I, um, th this is normally where you put the return type of the function. But because this is an entry part of the function, it doesn't actually return. There's a way of expressing that in Rust. And what you do is you use the exclamation mark here to say that this is a forever function. It never returns. Okay. So it takes no arguments. There's nothing in the brackets. And it never returns. That's what the exclamation mark is indicating here. So this is the basis of our main. Now, in order to find entry, actually, that's not including the prolude. The prolude is the stuff that's included that we can't see, that's included when it compiles any program, right? Um, so we, what we actually need to tell it about a library to handle the entry point for this given processor that we're using. So what we need to do here is uh, we need to bring a library in. We need to bring in a crate. And that's done via the use command, which you can think of as like an import in Python or a, um, a define in C, for want of a better term. Um, and here we need to use the Cortex 
uh, uh, M range. Hold on. Yes. I need to use any. Just gonna remember what this is called. Uh, core text. I think it's underscore M underscore real time. Library. And in particular, what we need here is the entry point uh, to support uh, what we've got going on. And we need to terminate the line with a semicolon. Not too unusual if you're from a C background. Um, we're going to need some other stuff as well that's really important here. Um, one thing that we do have to put in, I'll put this in at the top actually, which is very important. Um, so when things go wrong, i.e. things aren't handled, um, we need some support in there at a low level to deal with uh, poorly handled exceptions, etc. So we're going to use a panic halt model, which is a way of uh, doing that. It's saying it can't find that. We'll come back to that in a minute because um, we're going to have to enumerate some of these libraries in our TOML, cargo TOML file. So uh, let's just put this in first. The other thing that we're going to need is the library for this particular chip. So we've got the Cortex library, which is really the main ARM processor inside the F7, the STM32. But we need the STM32 F7 specific things, the hardware, the registers, or the abstractions uh, for that. So what we're going to use here is um it's called the stm32 hal actually uh, stm and they follow a certain um pattern uh stm32 and then it's normally the model number on sub model so it's an f7 uh, like that and then there's normally a couple of x's for the different model numbers, is it three X's or two? X two, and then the um, uh, HAL. Okay, so we're going to need that, um, and then because we're starting um, with a very simple example, we're going to need access to some basic peripherals. So. I want, in this case, I'm going to need, uh, oh, I'm going to need um, delay, I want to do a blinky or something, I'm going to need a delay. Now, I'm not getting much help from the ID here because it hasn't, doesn't know what to import library-wise. So let me just switch back for a second. And let's start enumerating because then the IDE can actually pick up some of these things with any luck. So if I do uh, if I go into here, um, it's created this TOML package. So the addition is the kind of, this is standard in Rust. Uh, and this is unlikely to change uh, unless there's a significant version change in, in Rust. I know there are different builds and stuff, but let me stick with edition 2018. Uh, thick set of um, uh, language support. Okay, so it's created this for me automatically, but here I need to put in some uh, important dependencies. Those libraries that we're bringing in, we're going to need to tell Cargo uh, what libraries um, we need. So what are we going to need? Let's have a look. Um, Uh, 
we're going to need the arm cortex light brace. Um, what you do is you normally dictate which version or a minimum version or a less than type version that you need. Um, we're also going to need the F7 libraries itself as well. This is where the basic oops. Uh, register level definitions are we will need this and basically the definition of the registers and things that get turned into the various structures and the stuff that's used by the hardware extraction level are created from an SVD file which is produced by the manufacturer and there's a piece of rust software that can, you can run on one of these SVD files that produces the standard register library for you which is quite cool. It means it's quite easy to bring in newer support. Um, we're going to need that. We're going to need. Hold on. Hmm. Oh, I'm missing. We're going to need panic. Port support. Um, the other thing we're going to need is the house. Uh, I can't remember what the version of that is. Hold on. Uh, there's something with, if I remember rightly, let's just copy that. I think I might need to change the underscore for a um, hyphen. And in terms of version, let me just look it up on the website. Excuse me for a sec, I can't remember what version this is. Uh, hmm. How do I get the number? Uh, 
current version. Do a change file. Not point two point naught, I think. Let's try that. Let's see if that does it. Luckily, my idea, IDE is giving me some clues here. Can you see that uh, it's actually looking at the various different libraries and it's downloading those, which is very cool, um, without me having to run the cargo command to do that. If you run cargo build or run, it will automatically go off and get what it needs in many cases. Um, No, 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 it's not what I'm trying to do at all. God. Right, what else might I need? I've got the uh sometimes you need the cortex register files as well. I found. And do I need something else? Let's leave it there for the moment. Let's see. It will soon tell us if that's not right. If we go back here now, what we should find is if I do So I need the delay and it should be, it should have picked that up automatically. Uh, and we need what's called the pack and the peripherals. Oh, sorry, the pack is the peripherals and the, what they call the prolude. I don't know why it's called the prolude actually. And we need everything under that because there's a whole load of stuff that we rely on. Pack volume. I can hear a small cat. Okay. So Russ seems happy. Oh, I need a semicolon. Uh, I just realized that uh, Laurie's asking a question. He says, um, do you expect to be able to reproduce the current ice core firmware in Rust? Uh, yes. There's a couple of um, fiery hoops I may have to jump through. Um, I'm also not sure what the early performance will be. Um, but I'm confident I can I can do pretty much what the ICE firmware currently does. I mean, we want to go further than that, obviously, but I'm confident that we'll be able to do at least what the ICE core firmware uh, already does. Um, by the way, I'm not thinking of at this point of replacing the ICE core firmware. I'm just using the ice core as a development uh, um, before we get the boards that we're really developing for. Although we could, do, there's, there's nothing stopping us using this on ice core. 
I'm sure we can get it to a stage where it's actually usable on there. It's just I'm unlikely to ship it um, because it will require a lot more testing before I'm happy shipping that on a board. Uh, I'm really just using the iScore as a development platform at this point. Um, can it do the DMA that you currently use? Uh, I think so. There are some gotchas around the DMA. Um, but I've done a bit of detective work and I think um, I think we'll be okay with that. Okay. Um, so what would be interesting now is if I just run cargo build, right? Just to see what it says. I'd be intrigued. At this point, it will go off and fetch everything that it doesn't doesn't have, all the dependency libraries, etc. Let's let it do that. It's a very cool tool cargo the way it goes off and gets everything you need so it's already told me i've got a problem here by the way it's very verbose in telling you about your mistakes it really is um you know oh i need to pass it a feature uh Okay, um, so what I need to do, it's got this thing of features because there'll be support for different versions of this, hold on, of this chip. So I need to do this. I need to say, uh, feature. Um, is it feature equals? Let me just remember. Features it's plural, and then I need uh, the features in this. And in this case, what I need to do is tell it I want to use the um, 7.30, what does it say? Yeah, STM 32F7 ah, We've got a little friend that's come to see us. She's just been having some biscuits. Say hello to all the streaming friends. Look, twinkles. I suppose you won't go out that door now, don't you? Hmm? Go on. Um, because we're using, you know, the, the HAL is generic. It's for the STM32F7XX. We need to be particular about this. We need to tell it which one because they've got different peripherals and stuff. So I need to say some 30 here, I think. That's what it's complaining about. Error package, black crab. Does not have this feature. Uh, 
Uh, hmm, it requires one of the following device features enable STM32 F7. Oh, is that not listing the? Is there? Look. This crate requires one of the features enabled. And I, oh, I think it needs to be um, normally. It needs you need to tell it that it's RT as well. Hold on, maybe that's what it's complaining about. I think I need to put support for this in. Let me just have a look at one of the others. I think I need to talk about this in the Tomo files. Let me open another example. I don't have a features section, do I? So I need to add a features section here. Uh, that's what I'm missing. Sorry, I told you there would be um, some bits. And here I need to list. Uh, list some things. Let me just copy and paste from something else. I'm just cribbing from the actual examples they have on their um, on, on the repo where this how resides. There are some um, samples, examples. We're going to need this as well, I think. Not now, but later, so I may as well put that one in, possibly. What have I got in STMF7? Um, I'm putting things in here that I don't necessarily need, but I might need in the future. I'm just cribbing another file here. And whilst I'm here, Uh, something I'm missing. Um, failed to pass the manifest feature 32F730 includes devices selected, which is neither dependency nor a feature. Um, Talk about separating off the development dependencies. So I should probably do that because uh, 
I will also need these other things as well, which I may as well put in. I can see some other things in here and I'm not sure if I needed to have those. Ah, uh, I don't know what LTDC is. So they've done this. about something else USB PH drive is neither dependency nor a feature yeah I need to add this in it's just the strange way that this stuff works you have to explain it all otherwise it gets upset that looks better so where were we oh yeah So it's gone off to fetch any um, extra bits that it needs and it looks like it's actually trying to build something now that'd be a good sign um, by the way if you set this up yourself there's a few extra steps that you have to do so as well as installing Rust, there's a, some extra things that you need to install with cargo for the embedded fan and I'll get a link for that at some point. Right, so what's it complaining about now? What did you do previous? Did not compile the how build file waiting for other job to finish build file. So why is it failing? This crates requires one of the following device features enabled. Uh, what did I just run? Didn't I just run it with features? Uh, so maybe it doesn't like that. Maybe it needs a space there. Plus GM thirty two F seven three zero, right? I don't think that's still got an issue. Still got an issue with me choosing uh, the version of chip I'm using here. Let me just look again what I've got here. Jameson thirty.
I selected in USB and I've covered those. I've got device selected in USB as USB. This. Well, it may be some other bits in this file but I'm not sure what these mean but maybe this is important hold on I'm just going to copy these out and paste them in I don't fully understand what they are but let's see if they make any difference because they're in their example Still having a problem. With the. With the version that I'm running. The chip. A minute, do I need because I've included the USB? Do I actually need to include that here? I don't think so. Right, let me just check. So it wasn't those things. Should be FS, not HS, I think. Or is that has USB P H five? Sorry, I'm being an idiot. What I don't understand is why is it not accepting my um, STM32 
Oh. Um. In the example that I'm looking at, that I'm cribbing from, they have different uh, different um, examples. They don't just have a main. I don't know if, where would I put that? Um, I need to tell it about required features. But where do I do that? Do it there. Oh, frustrating. Uh, Laurie's saying, are the commas correct? Maybe there's a different way of doing it. It's a good point. Maybe, do I do this? Yeah. I think the commas are correct for separating the features. Sorry. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Don't think I need the speech marks if I'm using the equals. Do it this way, see if that makes any difference. No, I've still got a problem. Maybe if I do that.
Oh, no, can't do that. Hmm. I wonder if There are a couple of extra things in here. Don't know if they're going to be relevant though. Let's put them in just in case. What I don't understand is why it's not selecting the right processor. It's making me look kind of daft. It's just going to go off and pick those up, but that doesn't solve our immediate problem. The one in here as well, just to include. Let me just check what am I pulling in? TS M7 SC30 F7 XX how? Great regards when the following device features enabled. Why am I enabling that in this command? Mm. Frustrating. I know when I played with it before, when I played directly with the um, 
how repository it worked, but that structure is slightly different. Maybe that's what's throwing me off. Just double check I'm spelling this right. So features equal STM 32F730, right? It's definitely listing that there as a candidate. I haven't typed that incorrectly, have I? No, could not compile STM32 from that file. Doesn't like this. This crate requires one of the following device features enabled. Wondering if I modified the how stuff at all. Oh, it's interesting. What Laurie's saying is don't use commas, use spaces. See if that makes any difference. Worth a go. No, that just confused it. Oh, I see what you mean. So you're saying if that was a like a string. I don't know if it would make any difference, but let's try it. The same. Let's just try the. Um, I'm missing something here. Maybe it's just not being passed in. At this level. Mm 
Uh, what's the stuff? But I don't know if that's relevant. I hear a cat again. Hmm, <laughs> same. How very annoying. Um, Hey, Twinks. Um, I mean, what I could do is copy the um, repository contents, but I don't really want to do that. Twinkles, how can we help you? I don't get why it's saying that the feature isn't enabled. I think I've um Twinkles, how can we help? Hmm? It's having a problem compiling the um, how library because why is that? Does it have to compile it differently? Okay, um, well, I need, will need to resolve this. I don't know if you want to hang around any longer because we've been going on a long time already. Um, maybe there's a structure issue here with the way that this is set out. It makes it different from... Trouble is, I'm trying to take information from the um, actual source code for the HAL and the way that they've configured uh, the, the projects. 
Um, there's another thing in here I haven't included, but I don't think this makes any difference. 7.36 I'm missing uh, something here and I can't quite work out what it is so I will return to this I will solve the problem um, I've certainly done some of the basic stuff inside a copy of the how. It's just my perspective has changed here when I'm pulling down the how as an external dependency, I think. And um, that's what's catching me out and I'm missing something because for some reason that feature doesn't seem to be passed into the how compilation so um, hmm. okay well we'll leave it there for the moment and we'll continue this on the next stream um, if I have some joy I might do another stream on Friday actually if I solve this problem just so that we can move on anyhow thanks for hanging with me temporarily ciao for now and I'll see you at the next stream